we built this long path. Now we go to phase one. We're going to turn this long path into a cycle. So I have a long path, and it has some size. The engineer is going to be so proud of me. I haven't messed up the controls today. Yeah, he's, he's, he's waving at me through the, through the screen. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw a slightly stylized picture. Because remember, as, as I hope has now become quite clear, that when we draw a picture of a graph, the... The drawing is not important. I keep emphasizing it's only who's adjacent to whom. All right, so here's the graph, and the, I mean the long path that we have found. This is a path of size t. And remember always t is greater than or equal to uh, n over 2 plus 1. It's at least half. Now, I want to turn this path into a cycle. And I'm going to use the fact that all the neighbors of the two endpoints are on the path. And here is the claim I'm going to make. If I look at the neighbors of this guy, it's more than half the vertices. And I look at the neighbors of this guy, it's more than half the total number of vertices. The pigeonhole principle says what? There's a vertex out there that's a neighbor of both of them. So what? I, that's not useful. But let me tell you what the pigeonhole principle, principle also tells me. It will say that somewhere out there, there are vertices i and i plus 1, where in my graph I have an edge from this vertex to the end and a vertex, an edge from this one to the beginning. Sort of a crossing one. Now, I want to challenge you. Who can explain to me why this follows from the pigeonhole principle. Got an answer? OK. Um, well, first off, you have an odd number of points. So if you had an even number of holes, two of them would have to be put together in terms of like your n over 2. <coughs> uh, that's I didn't like the first sentence you said. You have an odd number of points. T could be even or odd. I, so I, I, you might be, you might, as part of what you're saying, I think, is, is headed in the right direction. But I didn't like the starting line. The starting line doesn't have anything to do with the parity of T. OK, let's look. And there isn't a possibility that there would be two points. Well, how would you make that happen? You would divide them in half and then put all of the points that go to the left over here and all the points that go to the right over here. But because um, each one has a Three bigger than the size half, then at least at one point in the middle, they have to cross over to where they have adjacent points. You're sort of in the right direction. Um, you know, every now and then you, you just need to cast something and think about it in the right way. So let me suggest a way to think about this. Um, I want to mark the neighbors of, of this guy poorly. 
not, not well, poorly. So every time he has a neighbor, I'm going to mark the one on the left. So you see, that's a neighbor, right? So I'm going to put a mark here. Now, how many X's am I going to put? How many X's am I going to put? I'm going to put as many X's as there are neighbors, right? So if I, if I, if I put an X here, what does that mean? That means in the graph, there's an edge which goes like this. Okay, so mark the neighbors poorly. Mark them off by one. But if you tell me where the X's are, I can see the edges. And if you tell me where the edges are, I can see the X's. Agreed? All right, how many X's did I put? I'm going to put an edge, an X for every edge. How many edges does this guy have? He has at least n over 2 x's. Has at least n over 2 neighbors. Okay, now let's mark the neighbors of this guy, but let's mark them accurately. Let's put a Y exactly where this guy has a neighbor. And the conclusion is, I'm going to put an X on top of a Y. I'm going to have a Y on top of an X. Because how many Ys am I going to put down? At least N over 2. And there's not enough room to keep them separate. All right. So, that says somewhere I'm going to put an X, and I'm also going to come along when I'm doing it from the other end, I'm going to say I'm going to put a Y right here. Now, what that says is that in the second case, there's because I put that Y in the accurate place, there's an edge which goes this way, and I put an X there, which means there's an, an edge in red from the left-hand side, which goes one further. All right. And now, I hope it's clear to you that any time anytime you have your long path, and you can find somewhere in it a consecutive pair where this guy goes this way and this guy goes this way, you can turn this path into a cycle of the same size. Do you see it? Okay. How many, how many neighbors does this guy have? The condition that we started with is every vertex has at least n over 2 neighbors. So the number of x's will be at least n over 2. All right. So now, if I can do this, do you see the cycle? Do you see the Does everybody see it? You just have to traverse it in this slightly funny way. You walk down the thing this way and then stop, go over here, and then traverse this coming backwards, and then leap over this way. So if you give me a long path of size t, where t is more than half, then and, and the endpoints have all their neighbors on the path, then using the pigeonhole principle, nothing more, I get a cycle of size t. Same size, same size. Okay, now let's go back to the main desktop here. Okay, so in phase one, we take our long path and turn it into a cycle of the same size. 
And here, I've, I haven't drawn the edges crossing the way I did them on the uh, dock cam. But the existence of this cycle of the same size is just an application of pigeonhole. And you see, a computer would find that i and i plus 1 very quickly. So it would take your path and turn it into a cycle like that. Okay, now let's see what we do next.